How's everyone this evening? It's good to see you tonight. It's good to know that you're not away on vacation. <laughs> August is like vacation month, right? I know three people that always sit here in the front and they're all on vacation. So good for them. I hope they have a good time and God blesses them. Absolutely. If you go on YouTube, you can catch these. Uh, Joe Leonard's putting them on YouTube. Um, I noticed when I typed in Faith Community Gambrels, Maryland, that um, there's different kind of logos that come up, and there's a little box, and it says like Faith Community on it, and then it says Channel there next to it, and you can either hit the channel or you can hit the actual picture, and then all of a sudden you get lots of me. <laughs> so just a warning there, don't push it unless you really need to, um, but uh some people have looked for it and not seen it because it's in that thing and it says, I think it says faith community. Is that what it says? I think, I think that's, yeah, yeah. It's kind of, it's, it, you wouldn't know it's our church, um, but then when you, when you click on it, uh, if you go on our website, there's an intro by Pastor Kevin. That's on there. Pastor Steve's on there. Uh, there's the Wednesday nights. There's the Sunday morning services and, and so forth. And they go back uh, a while. So you can, you can check them out. God is, faithful. God, is faithful. God is faithful. That's it. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate that. All right. God is faithful. So we've got to get that word out there. Not that God is faithful. That's how you access to YouTube. <laughs> we already know God's faithful, right? We don't have to. Okay. Awesome. Well, let's get started with a word of prayer. And uh, then we'll be diving here uh, into Daniel tonight. Father... We thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for how you revealed this to, to Daniel. What an exceptional man he was. I was going to say, Lord, young man, but I know he was an exceptional young man, and these later stages of his life, when he's at in his 80s, he's, he's um, truly respected by your angels and yourself. And Lord, we just thank you for his testimony. Thank you, Father, as well, for the burden that you put on his heart as you revealed this to him. Help us, Lord, um, give us a measure of understanding as we approach your word tonight. Lord, we really want to know what it means. But, Father, we recognize that there are some things we can't know yet. And we pray, Lord, that you just bless us as we uh, seek to know what we can and to implement it and the truth of it, Lord, into our, our lives today. So we thank you, Father, for blessing us, bringing us out. And we just pray your blessing on tonight in Christ's name. Amen. If you take your Bibles, go with me to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. Give you a little bit of a, an introduction here uh, as we come into chapter 11 and just kind of fill things out. And then I just want to give you a simple little overview of what we're going to be talking about this evening so that hopefully uh, it, it makes sense to you. In Daniel chapter 10, uh, we read about uh, Daniel receiving this vision in chapter 10. And the Bible tells us that uh, Daniel uh, saw an image that was just truly amazing. Uh, he lifts up his eyes in verse 5. And as we notice the discussion and the description that went on, this was a man who was dressed in linen, whose waist is girded with a belt of pure gold of Euphaz. Uh, his body was like beryl. His face had the appearance of, of lightning. Uh, his eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished brass, and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. And Daniel alone saw this vision, the Bible says. And the question was last week when we talked about this, who is this person? We talked about it uh, from the standpoint of, is it a Christophany? It certainly seems to be a Christophany. And in Revelation, it seems to be uh, supported because there's a similar language that's going on between the two. And then we looked at the problematic areas of that in verses 10 and onward, where you have this one who is being sent, who looks very much like Jesus and portrayed as revelation. Um, and that was clear cut and there's no debate. And so we're trying to figure this out. And I have to confess, my wife said to me, well, maybe there's two people here. And I got looking at this and trying to, to figure this out. And this is, this is the conclusion I've come to. I hate to admit when she's right, um, and so I'll try to skirt this issue. 
I'd try not to admit it, of course. Uh, but the Bible says in verse 5, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man. And I found that that was interesting, uh, that that was um, a term that singled out this individual. Uh, nowhere else when you're introduced to an angel do you see that type of language. And there's enough of a, there's enough of a transition there in verse 9, I believe, to warrant this uh, assertion. And frankly, we would all agree, I think it makes the most amount of sense. And when you look at it and you look at it as portraying Jesus Christ, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You can't dodge the language that's there speaking about Jesus Christ. And then you come and you have all of these problems. How do you put it all together? But notice what happens in verse 9. Daniel says, I heard the sound of his words. And as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. So what we have is Daniel basically passes out. And then when he comes to, the Bible says that there's someone there, a hand is touching him. But it doesn't identify necessarily who that hand may be. The fact that it's someone who's sent could be that he was newly sent. And so as I bridged those two things together, that was my conclusion that my wife was indeed correct. So be that as it may, I will ask her to uh, help me teach tonight's lesson <laughs> for the simple reason that as we get into tonight's lesson, what I'm going to try to do, and it may seem tonight like we're chasing some rabbits, i got to be honest, and it may also seem that we really struggle to be able to identify exactly what the meaning of the passage is. So what I'm going to do is as we get into some of these areas tonight, I'm going to give you the, the difference uh, the different possibilities, and hopefully my goal tonight is not to tell you what this passage absolutely means, but to tell you here's what it potentially means, and, and familiarize you with these different passages and the arguments surrounding them. Does that make sense? So if I was going to write the syllabus that I wrote back in the spring, if I was going to rewrite that, I would definitely have the syllabus changed on lesson number eight and lesson number nine. In fact, I will do that after we're done this study. I will change it. And uh, if I teach it again, I will have it better laid out, all right? Because there's certain things that I've come to the conclusions on a little bit differently than when I first did this in the spring as I was working through it um, to try to get the syllabus together. So you'll bear with me, I trust, as we go to Daniel chapter 11. Uh, when you look at Daniel chapter 11, we have a, a large historical component that takes place. But between chapter 11, verse 35, and chapter 11, verse 36, there is an extended amount of time. This is the day and age that we find ourselves living in today. We live between verse 35 and verse 36 of chapter 11. So as we look at that, we understand that this is the church age because what we've talked about was some historical aspects dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes, the illustrious one, and then being introduced to this new king in verse 36 who is the Antichrist. And the Bible says that the king, and he describes the Antichrist there, we spent some time looking at that last Wednesday night. Tonight, my purpose is to go to verse 40 and see some of the events that surround uh, the Antichrist and try to understand, uh, best as we're able, what is happening here at this juncture in Daniel chapter 11. This is some serious prophecy here. It's uh, pretty fascinating. And I pick it up there in verse 40, which says, at the end time, at the end time. So we're talking here about the time most likely we're referencing here, I believe, Daniel's 70 weeks. Daniel's 70 weeks. Remember when we talked about Daniel and we talked about the significance of those 70 weeks. The 70 weeks basically lay out for us everything that happens here with Israel. Do you remember how many weeks was it in the first segment of the 70-week prophecy? Do you remember? There were seven. One week equals 
how many years? Seven years. If there are seven weeks, how many years is that? See, you guys were listening in multiplication class in second grade. And then over here, we have 62 weeks. And how many years is that? 434 years. So this is like, uh, what is it, 458 to 409. <clears throat> and then you come down, you do the math, you come to this 62. And the Bible is very precise as to when that is, is going to end. It's going to end when, do you recall? When Messiah is caught off, right? And so let me just put the cross up here. After the cross, we have how many more weeks? There are 70 altogether. We've had seven. We've got 62. We've got one more. But the interesting thing is, it doesn't happen right on the heels of that 69th week. We have a period of time. Just like we're in between verse 35 and verse 36 right now, we have a period of time. What is it that separates, it, it, and truly in the meaning of all this, what is it that separates all of these years, and I'm going to just put this last one here, seven years. What is it that separates this period of time and differentiates it from all these other weeks? What's the difference? Exactly. It's a focused time here on Jews and Gentiles comprising the body of Christ. Everything else pertains to, to Israel. Exactly. In fact, we're not even done at the end of the tribulation because this is the seven years, this is the tribulation. We're not even done at the end of this tribulation with Israel because the millennial kingdom is the fulfillment of so many of the Old Testament prophecies, isn't it? And so it's all about Israel again. We live and we breathe in the one time period when Christ has given to the world a mystery. And that's exactly what Paul called it. When he talks about the mystery has been revealed. What's the mystery? The mystery is you and me. The fact that we can have access to God directly is the mystery that we enjoy today. Isn't it a great time to be alive? Think about what it would have been like if you were living uh, even previous to this time. Because Israel, you remember, starts with, who was it that was called out of Ur of the Chaldees? Abram, and he was called out. God said, I'm going to make these promises. He drew in covenant with Abraham, and uh, he changes his name, and he begins to bless him. Later, there's other covenants that come along as well. Interestingly, it was all about Israel all along the way. In fact, other than the occasional individual who came to faith in God back during these time periods, for the most part, the Gentiles were hostile to the Jewish people. And God used them oft times to judge the Jewish people, didn't he? And so that's kind of the context of the Gentiles and the Jews over the years. And the same thing is going to be true when it comes to the tribulation time. So we're going to pick this up and we're going to see how these wars and uh, all of the things that uh, Daniel's talking about are going to influence the people of Israel. But today, what a great time to be alive. We're looking forward to the rapture of the church. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen right here at the beginning of this tribulation. Because God's going to say, you know what? Uh, you know what he calls us? His bride. And he's going to come for his bride. He's going to say, okay, bride, you know, you're not going to face the wrath. He's already told us in his word. You're not going to face the wrath that is to come. I'm going to airlift you out of here. <clears throat> and he's airlifted other people, hasn't he? He surely has. And up we're going to go, and there are seven years of tribulation then that will follow. But his bride will be with him in heaven. Again, those are people who have placed their faith in Jesus now and are from whatever background that may be. But they all have in common. We all have the same thing in common, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. So that is kind of the overview that we see here as we look at the timeline and we see how Daniel's prophecy has been worked out. What Daniel is going to receive here in chapter 11 is some more information which is particular to this time period now right here. 
So when you get to Daniel chapter 11 and you get to 36 and onward, you're going to find out more information that happens during this tribulation time. That tribulation time could start right now, couldn't it? It could start right now. As soon as the rapture takes place, uh, the whole tribulation begins to roll out. And as the tribulation rolls out, it's going to be a time of, of great torment on the earth. Now, there's some things that are going to happen. There's some serious battles uh, that are going to take place. And see, we got, it's a good thing we have plenty of space tonight. Uh, <clears throat> there are some serious battles that are going to take place. And this is where we pick this up in verse 40. So I'm going to erase the board and uh, hopefully here uh, draw you up something different. So if you wanted that, hopefully you took a picture with your phone. <laughs> All right. Notice with me there's three different players that take the field in verse 40. At the end time, the 70th week, the king of the south will collide with him. So we have the king of the south. I would draw him, but he would look like the abominable snowman. And who else do we have? We have the Antichrist. How is he identified there in that passage? He is king. And what, el what other terms identify him? I don't want to get too deep on you guys. Notice with me it says they will collide with him. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> him. I'll show you why that matters here in a moment. The king of the south, king of the south, the king, and who's the third player? The king of the north. The king of the north. And guess where we'll put him? We're going to put him up here. The Bible says that the king of the south will collide with him. The him being a reference to the he back in verse 39, he will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign god. He, Antichrist, will give great honor uh, to those who acknowledge him and will cause them to rule over the many and will parcel out land for a price. At the end of time, the king of the south will collide with him, the Antichrist. The king of the north will storm against him. The, the Hebrew tense there if you you want to describe it as that the stem gives a tremendous intensity there showing that this king of the north is is really intense and then it actually becomes more intense a little bit later in this passage he will storm against him with chariots with horsemen with many ships he'll enter countries he'll overflow them and pass through he will also enter the beautiful land you want to take a guess what the beautiful land is a reference to? Israel, exactly. And many countries will fall, but these will be rescued out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. Then he'll stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. But he'll gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and Libya and the Ethiopians will follow at his heels. Literally, they'll trail along behind him. But rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he'll go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. He'll pitch the, uh, the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain. We believe that the beautiful holy mountain there is a reference to Jerusalem. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Now, it's important for us to try to, to put some of these things together. If you take your notes and your syllabus and you go with me to last week's session, so it's session number eight, 
And at the bottom of the third page, you'll see a prophecy concerning the final king of the north. King of the south, king of the north, both come against the same king who is the Antichrist. That much we know. Tell him I'm not here. <laughs> the geographical movement suggests the Antichrist is in Palestine. Military movement, we see the northern invasion with all these chariots, horsemen, and ships. And it's a reference there that the south doesn't get. You'll notice there that the king of the south is just mentioned, but his military component is not emphasized. So it's more than likely that this king of the north will be much more able militarily and have much more force with him. Now, your, your syllabus says that the northern invasion will overthrow many countries. And where this is interesting, and there, here's where it kind of uh, uh, works its way out, and we have some questions, and this is why I can't, I can't give you a definitive, absolute answer. I can tell you maybe what I think, but I can't, I can't give it with authority. One of the questions is, who is the he in verse 41, he'll enter the beautiful land, many countries will fall. It just got through talking about the king of the north, didn't it? And so the question is, uh, in, in theologians' minds, and you're all theologians, by the way, because you're studying the word of God, that's what makes you a theologian. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being a theologian. And you are, you're a theologian. Look, you've come all these weeks, and you're studying God's word, and uh, that's more than most people in this world are doing. And uh, in my mind, uh, and I think in God's mind too, I can say you're a theologian, you're studying God's word. But the question among us theologians is who this he is a reference to. He'll enter into the beautiful land and many countries will fall. Now, my noted seminary professor, who's one of the most brilliant people I've ever met, believes that this is a reference to the king of the north and that the king of the north will come through and conquer countries. And uh, it, it's fascinating how that works out. So what I want you to see here is, is how this kind of uh, plays out in reality here as you look at this. If the he, if the he is the king of the north, If the he is the king of the north, he is going to come against the Antichrist. Where is the Antichrist residing at this point? It stands to reason he's in Palestine. And the reason why we would say that, first off, is that you have a king from the north and a king from the south coming down on him. He can't be too far out west because that's the Mediterranean Sea. And if you go too far to the east, you're going to be coming to a desert. So... Where has that land always been in harm's way? Right there in Israel, right there in Palestine. And so let's understand it this way. We have Israel, and this is Jerusalem. You got that? Everybody see that? that that's Jerusalem right there. And this is where this king is. The king of the north comes pressing down with all types of weaponry, and he's coming against the Antichrist. This much we do know for sure. And, and we're all agreed that this is the case. The king of the south comes pushing up. And the Bible tells us that there are some who are, who are rescued, some who are not destroyed. Who are those three that are, are not destroyed? Who are they? Modern-day Jordan. These three are going to stay. And they're going to be, they're not going to be slaughtered according to this passage of Scripture. Which is interesting given their history with Israel and given the potential that the Antichrist could actually be Islamic in his background religiously. We don't know. So when we look at this, we have these two kings who are coming together it would seem apparent that Egypt, being weighed down here, is not part of this 
confederacy of nations who are coming up from the south. It would seem that they're not, they're not part of that. Because what ends up happening is the king of the north uh, comes against uh, the Antichrist while the king of the south presses up against him here. This is where it gets interesting. If the king of the north is the he, he is going to overflow the Antichrist. And he's going to be the one who goes all the way down to Egypt and takes the spoils from Egypt, takes the treasures, the silver, the gold that the Bible speaks about. He then, and you'll look there in your notes, he then is going to be the one who receives an evil message from the east and the north. Now, if you take your Bible and go back with me, just I'm going to keep my ribbon here in Daniel, but I'm going to go back to Revelation and Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, we're introduced to the Antichrist. The dragon st stands on the sand of the seashore. He, he, that dragon is Satan. He sees a creature coming up out of the sea, having ten hordes and seven heads. This is the Antichrist who he is seeing here. And the Bible says in verse 3, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. Those who believe that the he is a reference to the king of the north and not the Antichrist, believe that the king of the north pushes down through and takes the spoils of Egypt. But while he is south of Palestine, he hears news from the north and the east that are disturbing to him. And namely, what he's probably hearing is that the Antichrist has suffered a wound thought to be fatal, but he's come back to life. That has been one of the most common teachings when you come to Revelation 13 for a very long period of time. And very well may be the case. I know that's what my seminary professor believed, and uh, he absolutely believed. And you see that in your notes. They, gave, uh, they give the, the Antichrist or his kingdom a deadly wound. And uh, he is able to recover. And uh, when the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast, uh, after his fatal wound was healed. And so there he is, he gets this wound, and some people believe that, that he died, that he was resurrected uh, through the power of Satan, and that he was capable then of, of leading the nations, and uh, the, the war continues on. I am not sure that that's the case. All right? There are other brilliant people who would take the he to be a reference to the Antichrist himself. And it has to do with the language here in the Hebrew and the antecedent that's there, and I don't want to get overly technical, but let's go back to Daniel chapter 11, and let's look and see what it says there so that we will understand it, uh, hopefully. And hopefully now you're starting to get a, at least a little bit more familiar with some of these things. So when you look at verse 41... The he, if you relate that to the Antichrist, he will also enter the beautiful land, that's Israel, and many countries will fall, um, but some are going to be rescued from his hand. He'll then stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. The, the noteworthy there would be that Egypt is probably part of the southern confederacy, and he goes down there and exacts judgment upon the people of Egypt for their participation in coming against him. And ultimately what he does is he is able to defeat all of those armies that are coming down from the north and all these armies that are coming against him that are coming from the south. He's able to defeat them. And when he does that, uh, he'll gain control over all the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Remember... Money is very vital to his success. In fact, so vital that in verse 39, we said last week that the peoples that he conquered, he gave honor to some of them, causing them to rule over many, and he parceled out their land for a price. In other words, if you wanted to be a leader under this Antichrist, you would pay him homage 
for that area of land that you would be ruling over. Not a bad gig, right? I mean, you know, it keeps him going. So that's, he's pretty smart. He's actually able to fund his war efforts by doing this. So he's interested in going down evidently to Egypt because of the treasures that are in Egypt. And so he's, he's willing to go down and to do this. After this war is done, verse 44, but rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he'll go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. And so there he is. Uh, he has conquered. Uh, some people think that he pushes through this Antichrist after this king of the north is destroyed. He comes on down here. Uh, and takes the spoils of Egypt, it's at that point he hears some news from the north. Some people think that it's a Jewish uprising. I don't think that's particularly likely. I think more likely is that he's hearing from the north and the east that there is an army of 200 million that are approaching. And it's going to take them a long time to get there, but I believe that that's where his concerns are. Now let me say this. I believe that this battle here in Daniel chapter 11, in essence, begins the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon, uh, the, the word for battle, uh, is the word for a long protracted war. Think World War III. And this war is not a battle like the Battle of the Bulge. It's fought over a shorter period of time. It's done. This is a battle that's going to last for a long, long time. These armies that are coming in from the east will be traveling over a long period of time. Where I see Daniel chapter 11 and the passage that we're talking about here, I see it time-wise at the midpoint of the tribulation. That's where, that's where I would place this. At this juncture... When you look at Daniel, you can kind of put some things into perspective and you can try to get some type of a, of a handle on it. Can we see that there would be nations? Can we see that there would be nations from the south that would be coming against Israel? Can we see that there would be armies from the north that would come against Israel? Let me see if I can uh, just show you this briefly here. Israel right now is surrounded by enemies. Look at that. There's something I need to do to this. Does anybody know what I need to do to it? Wise guy. Basically what you see here uh, if you go to Israel, Jerusalem's here. It's this little block that's not uh, green. Everything else is, is green. Uh, the Sunnis are those who are in the light green color. So you have your Islamics who are all here. You have pockets here. And it's actually expanded quite a bit since this map was, was done. But you can see the areas here in Serbia and so forth. It's actually pushing farther south. Um, Islam has not really been sub-Saharan in the past, uh, but it's making inroads as it pushes farther and farther south. So the thought process is that you have Egypt here, but we know that some of these countries like Libya and, and uh, Sudan and, and so forth are mentioned in Scripture. Iran, you'll notice, is in this darker green color. That's because they are not Sunnis, they are Shias. And the Sunnis are much more mellow and much more traditional, less um, oriented, I'll say less oriented towards jihad than the uh, Shias are. There's actually three different caliphates that have all come down uh, and emerged since Muhammad. Muhammad never named a successor, and so you have to remember that these three caliphates um, the, the third one's very small. The Sufis are, are kind of a mystical group, and, and they're fascinating if you ever want to study it. Uh, ISIS is actually a fourth caliphate. Uh, they believe that the Sunnis and the Shiites 
are not the rightful heirs to Muhammad and Islam, and they're going about trying to uh, take over, basically, the Islamic world with this fourth caliphate, all right? All of these different groups, it's funny, uh, when you look at it, whether it's Buddhism, and you look at the world religions, Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, we're all looking for the same thing, but very different. In other words, we're looking for Jesus Christ in his return. The Jews are looking for what? Messiah. Uh, the Buddhists are looking. They've got uh, their person coming. The Hindus have theirs. Uh, the the uh, Muslims have Imam Mahdi, and they're waiting for him to come. And so there's among all of these groups, and it's very pivotal here, uh, some of the things that are happening in Syria and some of the cities that they're fighting over uh, are actually being fought over things that are prophetic in Islam. Isn't that amazing? Uh, there's a particular city there that they need to have. They've got to have it. And uh, they're battling like crazy, uh, ISIS is, to take that control of that city away uh, from Sunnis and Shiites. So uh, motivation, definitely from uh, a prophetic standpoint. But you can see how all these countries uh, are aligned and seem to be wanting to, um, to, to push Israel out. Isn't that amazing? Does everybody see Israel right there? Yeah, that little bit. It kind of looks like water because it's not green. They are surrounded and then some. And uh, it's, it's going to be a challenge for them, certainly in the days ahead. Now, how confused are you? You're not confused at all, right? You have it totally down, and you're ready to go on to stage two. There's no test. There's no <laughs> as long as there's no test, we're all in. Okay, I like that. I like that. So here's the thing. I, I, I want you to be familiar with the, the overall aspects, and, and some of these things hopefully will ring back in your mind. When you come to verse 40 and verse 41 talking about the king of the south and the king of the north, um, many people believe that this is traceable back to Ezekiel. So if you take your Bibles and go back with me to Ezekiel, we go back to Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39. Chapter 38 and chapter 39. In verse 1 of chapter 38, it says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face towards Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O God, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I'll turn you about, put hooks in your jaws, bring you out, and all your army, horses, and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Put, which is Libya, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, with all its troops, troops Beth Togarma, from the remotest parts of the north, with all its troops, many peoples with you. The reason why I bring this up <clears throat> is because of the fact that there are those who would say, that Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39 are part of the prophecy as it pertains to Daniel chapter 11. Is everybody with me? All right. I personally don't believe that. And I want to give you seven views. Are you ready for seven views? You're going to write these down? There are seven views. Just look at it, YouTube, you know, don't even bother. Um, seven views of who this may pertain to. One is, and I will throw this out right away, is that this isn't literal anything, it's just symbolic. We're going to throw that one out. The second view <clears throat> is that this is a battle that will take place prior to the tribulation. Jesus said in the time leading up, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Could it possibly be? Uh, maybe, but not very likely at all because it doesn't seem to correlate at all with the end times uh, events. In fact, we see at the very beginning of Daniel's 70th week 
Daniel 9.27 says that this one world leader, the Antichrist, will make a peace treaty with Israel. So I don't believe that that's going to, to be the case uh, and it occurs before the tribulation. A third view is that the battle will occur in the middle of the tribulation, that it's associated with Revelation 14 and Daniel 11, 40 and 41. And that's the reason why I'm bringing it up here. Uh, because uh, teaching in the past has typically been uh, that this is describing this battle, the king of the north and the king of the south. Now, if you have, and I don't, how many have an authorized version? That's what you're using, authorized version, King James, okay? All right, it, New King James will work as well. If you went to chapter 39 and verse 2, you would read there in the authorized version, uh, the translation speaks about five-sixths of the armies of the king of this north, and it doesn't mention king of the north, so, so we won't get too uh, excited about that. Um, but he mentions Gog and Magog coming down uh, and being destroyed, five-sixths of them, on the mountains outside of Israel. So historically, the teaching has looked like this. King of the north comes down, five-sixths of his army gets wiped out here, the Antichrist goes on down and wipes out the king of the south. That's been traditionally what I was taught from about the time I was 10 years old. The problem with that is none of your modern translations translate it five-sixths. Uh, and most everyone would agree that this was a mis translation, the 5-6 part, and uh, in fact, the Hebrew verb is, is really what's in view there, and I think the, the, the aspect of the word itself being a verb wasn't translated that way, and so by looking at it with newer uh, text, you could see that it was a verb and, and not uh, speaking here of the sixth part of noun. So he's saying here, drag you along, literally is what the Hebrew says, so God will drag the army of Gog to a stunning and miraculous defeat. And that's why we read it differently in the more modern translations. So that's the reason for that. And keeping that in mind, we'll go back to these seven definitions. Seven definitions, um, picking it up with the fourth one, the battle will occur at the end of the tribulation and it's equated with the battle in Revelation 19. The fifth is that the battle occurs during a transitional period that's between the end of the tribulation or between the 70th week and the beginning of the millennium. I don't see that either. There's no way. Okay? So that's, that's a real impossibility. The sixth potential is that the battle will occur at the end of the millennium and should be equated with Revelation chapter 20. So when you think of these ginormous battles, and you go to Revelation, and Revelation, for instance, chapter 14, and verse uh, 14 through 20, um, then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap. The hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. He who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was reaped. And so that's the passage of reaping and that's where they would equate that. And they would also add that with Daniel chapter 11. The other battle is Revelation 19. Revelation 19, and this correlates in some people's thoughts with this fourth, uh, this fourth possibility where the battle is at the end of the tribulation. Revelation 19, verse 11, is the second coming of Christ. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in his righteousness he judges and wages wars. His eyes are a flame of fire, etc., and we have him coming, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that he can strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath 
of God. And so this is that um, aspect there. That's speaking there, second coming, the final aspect of the Battle of Armageddon. Remember, I believe the Battle of Armageddon is a long battle. And it starts at that midpoint of the tribulation and it goes right on through those last three and a half years. It's raging and these nations are coming against Antichrist and, and they will, uh, he'll be able to take control um, and be able to, to accomplish some, some pretty amazing things. The other here is going back to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. So some would say that on the sixth, and this is the sixth view of this battle, the sixth view is that in chapter 20, in verse 7, the thousand years, the millennial kingdom, it's concluded. Satan has been bound during the millennial kingdom for almost the whole thousand years. But at the very end, he's released. And he goes out and he deceives the nations and he deceives so many people, they're like the numbers like the sand of the seashore. You can't even number them all. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So that's speaking of a war against Jesus Christ at the very end of the millennial kingdom. Now, wouldn't you think after the second coming and the finality of all that, that these guys would just lay off? I mean, seriously, I mean, you, you would think that. Um, and the Bible says fire came down from heaven. There's no surprise there either. I mean, the more you read God's word, you figure that's, that, that's bound for the course. And after it's all done, these who deceived, the devil, was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. The Antichrist is already there. The false prophet is there as well. And they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. So you have eternal damnation that takes place as a result of this final battle. Final battle is going to involve an enormous number of people. Their number is impossible to even compute. And so when you look at this, you have all of these different possibilities. The seventh possibilities, I told you there'd be seven. Uh, one writer writes and he begins to, to explain his position for thinking that this is a battle that actually begins at the midpoint of the, the tribulation, the midpoint, and continues on until the second coming, and then in effect continues right on going. Uh, it, there's an interlude, and then it's at the end of the millennial kingdom that it starts up, and then it's done forever. Very confusing in my mind, okay, um, to try to do that. So what we're saying is it's hard to pin this down Exactly. Let me give us a clue, though. Go back to Revelation with me, if you would. Because I think uh, you'll want to see this in Revelation chapter 20. It says that Satan is going to be released from the prison, chapter 20 and verse 7, and he'll come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the sea. But did you see Gog and Magog mentioned? Gog and Magog are mentioned there. And if you look back, you don't have to do this. You don't have to look back. But when you consider the uh, nations that are mentioned, the peoples that are mentioned uh, here in there it is. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 38, you have all of these different players mentioned. You have Put, which I mentioned was Libya. Uh, you have Tubal, Gomer, Pargama, Meshach, Magog, Rosh, Persia, and so forth. You have all of these different countries and people groups that are mentioned. Many of them, they are all converging here, as you can see on our map. Historically, the teaching, and, and I'm sure... Some of you have heard this. Gomer was a reference to what country? Germany. Uh, Rosh, reference to Russia, and so forth. And some of these are easy to identify, and others are very difficult to identify. This map takes into account some of the ancient names and tries to pin down where these tribal groups were from. 
And this is, what they, this is where they came up. Most of this is Asia Minor. But the Bible does give us a caveat because it says, and remote parts of the north. So you certainly can have, in a final battle, people coming down from Russia. It doesn't rule that out at all. And some of these um, are difficult and some of them are unknown. So we, we wouldn't even be able to classify where these groups are from and where they're, where they're going to, to play such a prominent role in this, um, this enormous battle. I do notice that in the passage of Scripture in Ezekiel that there's judgment that's associated with fire and brimstone, which is very similar to what Revelation chapter 20 talks about. So it could be that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is a reference there to the final battle of the ages. And it could be that it has a double fulfillment in the sense that it's also taking place during the tribulation and then in a way is referencing over to Revelation chapter 20. There's a lot we don't know. I want you to be familiar with it from the standpoint of saying, this, this is really what I want you to know. I want you to be able to look at Daniel chapter 11 and say, I think there's a connection to Ezekiel. <laughs> All right? <laughs> that's, that's what I want you to know. And so uh, if you can do more than that, then great. But uh, there's, there's some great prophetic passages here. And as time goes by, there will be more clarity on the part of Christians who are studying this passage of Scripture. What has happened since I've been a Christian is there's been more and more clarity. For instance, we used to teach with authority that the king of the north, five-sixths of his army would be slaughtered on the mountains outside of Jerusalem. We no longer teach that with authority. Some people might teach it, but there are always those questions that are lingering because of the translation of the verb versus using it as a noun. These names, there has been further study because there's been more discovery in history of these people groups and we're identifying where they're coming from and so we're not just quick to, you know, use phonics and say, hey, Gomer sounds like Germany. You know, we got G-M-R, that's Germany. G and, and that's literally how some of it came about. Brilliant people put this together. People like Josephus, have you ever heard of Josephus? Yeah, he's, he's kind of influencing and then Gensius. I mean, you've got some brilliant minds who believe that Gomer was a reference there to Germany. So we're working through this. I just want you to be familiar so that when you leave this study, you can say, okay, here's Daniel chapter 11. We know the north and king, northern and southern kings both converge against the Antichrist. There's a couple of possibilities who the he is and what that might look like. And some people think this is a reference over here to Ezekiel. If you know that much, you are doing great, <laughs> okay? And, and that is an awesome, awesome thing. So, again, uh, as you can see, there's just, there's just a lot to all of these things. And Daniel, in chapter 11, um, if you flip back over there, uh, you see uh, that the king who is victorious, will plant his tents between the seas, the beautiful holy mountain. And I believe that that is consistent with the Antichrist coming to Jerusalem, and it's at that point in time that he will be worshipped by the world. My uh, understanding is that these two invasions, enormous as they are, uh, take place at the midpoint of that tribulation. And by the Antichrist being victorious over the king of the north with all of his mighty weaponry and so forth, you say, well, how can the Antichrist actually win? Remember, he is worshiping the God of that which is military. And his power is everything to him. Because he's able to eliminate the king of the north and the king of the south, and he has amassed some wealth, he will be in a position then to dictate to the world his demands. Literally, you need to be worshiping my image. You need to be taking my mark. You can't buy or sell without it. I am pushing the people of Israel out. The covenant is broken. There's no more a deal anymore. Uh, he comes back to the, to the 
to the promised land, to the beautiful city, and he comes back there to Jerusalem, and it's there he sets things up, and now he demands that the world worship him. The only people that will be contesting that will be those uh, Christians, obviously, who will be being martyred for their faith, and the 200 million army that will emerge from the east. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? I, 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 I'm going to date myself. I remember hearing people say, you know, we don't really know literally what that 200 million army looks like because it certainly couldn't be an army of 200 million people. If you look and you see the populations of India and China, it is just exploding, especially India. I think India is going to be the number one most populated country in like 20 years, more than China. More than China. Yeah. It's just amazing. Well, China's been saying you can't ha have a birth rate of, right? So, so it doesn't take long to, to catch up. But India's flying. Indonesia will be the third biggest uh, country population-wise in not very long. The United States is number three right now. But we're going to be falling. And Indonesia will be right behind China. 200 million. China already has an army of 200 million people. If you mix in those other two countries right there, you can have the potential of, of even more than that. So uh, what we used to think it changes over time. As things get clearer, uh, we see th things a little bit more uh, uh, with more clarity, and we do our best. So that's what I mean tonight with tonight's lesson. I want you to be familiar with what these passages say and what the potential is for this and that um, and where to go in the Scripture to be able to look at it so that you can kind of get a working knowledge of it and uh, be able to understand it and, and hopefully generate some self-study on your part. Um, hopefully this will really prompt an interest on your part to say, you know what, I want to go back and I want to look this up because uh, Pastor Kevin told me I was a theologian and uh, <laughs> I, I want to work on that myself and uh, dig into the Word of God. And if you need resources, uh, I'd be happy to, um, to, to point you in the right direction. So hopefully... Uh, uh, that'll, that'll bless you, all right? Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we just thank you for the word of God as we've studied it tonight. And Lord, uh, we don't have all the answers, uh, but Lord, we know you do. We know you have a plan. And you've given to us uh, your word, Father. And uh, someday this will be extremely clear uh, to the people of that day. Uh, in the meantime, Father, we recognize, Lord, for us that uh, it's imperative that we stay faithful to you that we live for you and that we honor you and glorify you because we're uh, seeing how these plans, Lord, are beginning to evolve. Uh, Lord, it's easy for us, and we don't know, but we, we feel, Lord, that your coming is, is going to be soon. And we look at this world and we see how, how the nations are aligning and, and we see the, the potential that's there. And, uh, Lord, we recognize, Father, that we need to be diligent. May, we, may that be the message that we receive. And may our understanding of your word, Lord, be enhanced because of the time spent today, together tonight. Uh, and may you bless each one, Lord. I just thank you for their faithfulness, their desire to study your word, and to be able to, to be knowledgeable about all that you've given to us in your revelation. Help us, Lord, to, to apply it. Help us to understand it and, and crave to know you better, Lord. So bless each one. Give us safety as we travel and uh, a great rest of the week ahead as we come back to worship you Sunday, Lord. We look forward to that in Jesus' name. Amen. You're welcome. So you're sitting in the class, but I'm catching up on YouTube. Good. So that's really, I appreciate that.